Hey, so welcome everyone to St. Louis County Library's virtual program, Fabulous Fall Reads. Uh, I am Sarah, I'm an adult services librarian at St. Louis County Library, and um, my specialty is reader's advisory, which is like matchmaking between books and readers. So we are really excited to have you here this evening. So before we get uh, started into the content of the program. I just want to draw your attention to a few features of our Zoom environment uh, this evening. So tonight's program is in a webinar format. That means that your camera and microphone are not active, so no one can see or hear you, even though you can see or hear us. Uh, if you do have trouble hearing um, us or seeing us, we usually suggest that you exit the webinar, move a little bit closer to your router or like reconnect to your internet and then re rejoin the, the webinar. Uh, also, I do have the captions uh, enabled. So if you would like to see the captions, hide them, or uh, use the change the font size, you can do, do that using the captions logo in your icon bar. And we do have the chat enabled. So if you have questions, you can go ahead and enter them into the chat box. Those questions go just to myself and the other presenters. And we will have a Q&A section at the end of the presentation. So feel free to enter any uh, questions you have as we go along, but we'll, we'll be answering them uh, at the end. So uh, tonight's presenters are uh, myself. I'm Sarah. I work in the adult services department. I'm also joined by Tammy from the Parkview Van branch, uh, Catherine, who works in Customer Connect, which is our, our phone library, uh, all of the um, library staff who answer when you call the library. And then uh, normally I have Harry with me, but Harry was not able to join us tonight, but I do have his picks. They are in the handout that um, I sent out uh, earlier this afternoon. Um, and the, I'll send out in the follow-up email. And I have some some short blurbs from him about his, his picks. So I will go ahead and read his picks, uh, but unfortunately he wasn't able to join us tonight. Uh, so we will each be talking about five books that give us like fall vibes and one forthcoming pick. Um, and I did ha send out a, a handout for you to follow along if you register before say one o'clock this afternoon. If you didn't get that, no worries. We are recording this presentation. It will be posted on our YouTube channel. And when that is ready to, to be viewed, I will send a follow-up email with the link to the video and the handout attached again. And uh, the handout does have links to our catalog so you can place uh, the books that we talk about tonight on hold. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. So my first couple of picks have to do with like fall vibes for me, like the genres that I really love reading in the fall. And Halloween is a little bit more than a month away. So I definitely wanted to include a horror title. And so my first pick is How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix. And Hendrix is the kind of horror author that I'd recommend even if you don't normally like read horror. Um, his books have this very unique tone that includes like humor and bittersweet poignancy mixed with legitimately scary content. He focuses on relationships with really well-drawn characters, and the evil in the book is often resulting from trauma that the uh, antagonist has faced or like social trauma. And um, this makes, you know, it's somewhat more sympathetic and adds a realistic feel to the story. In this novel, Louise and Mark are siblings with a very tense relationship. Uh, Louise was the like overachiever in the family that felt ignored and has moved out of state for kind of a like a high powered job. And Mark is the underachiever who was coddled by their mother, but resented Louise for reasons that like he he doesn't really want to talk about. So they are forced to come to terms with each other when their parents die under like kind of mysterious circumstances and they need to work together to sell the house. Um, it soon, soon becomes clear though that something very strange is going on there, especially with their mother's large doll and puppet collection. <laughs> so family secrets will need to be dealt with in order to escape with their lives, you know, much less getting the house uh, sale ready. Uh, so if you want a good, creepy, haunted house book to read in the fall, but you also like family dramas with some dark humor and a really heartfelt ending, then this is the one for you. Okay, another genre that I like to read, well, all year round, but especially in the fall, is cozy fantasy. And these kinds of books tend to have feel-good stories that revolve around relationships in a family or a community with a small town or a close city neighborhood setting. And the magic 
and supernatural aspects provide like an atmosphere and can complicate or help heal the relationship conflicts you know as opposed to like high fantasy um where there is like an explicit magical system and like an epic battle to fight so sometimes they're blended with other genres like mystery or in this case romance so um this pick is the only purple town the only purple house in town by Anna Gire and uh the main character Iris is the quirky black sheep in her family of successful literal emotional vampires. So everyone in her family feeds off of the emotions of others in order to gain power to practice like a special gift. And they all treat Iris rather poorly because she doesn't seem to have this ability. Um, her life is um, in a bit of a mess when the novel opens, but she luckily inherits a rundown Victorian mansion, like a big Victorian house from her great aunt. In order to support herself and uh, up, you know, pay for the upkeep of the house, she takes in some renters, the first of which happens to be Eli, a guy who has harbored a secret crush on her since, since a childhood incident where she saved him from bullies. He doesn't really even like need the rented room because he's a successful software developer with several houses of his own uh, and the ability to shapeshift into a hawk but he's kind of socially awkward and he accidentally like accepted the rental agreement uh, through kind of a miscommunication uh, and worse yet Iris doesn't seem to remember him or this like childhood incident that was so important to him at all so will he ever be able to tell Iris you know who he really is that he has feelings for her and why um, along the way, Iris attracts more charmingly misfit housemates, some of them magical and some of them not, and she has to deal with the rising prejudice um, amongst non-magical people in town, especially her pushy, like, kind of antagonistic neighbor. So this book take, does take place in the autumn, with many mentions of falling leaves and tea and coffee and that sort of thing. So if you're looking for something heartwarming to cozy up with this season, then this is a really great pick. Okay, so I was a student for like a shockingly large portion of my life and my mom was a teacher. So I always associate fall with back to school season. So my next few picks go kind of with that theme. Um, and True Biz by Sarah Novich is set at the River Valley School for the Deaf and is told from the perspective of several different characters. Um, the first is the headmistress, February, who is attempting to save both the school and her marriage from collapse. Um, popular student Austin struggles with changes in his multi-generational deaf family when his sister is born hearing. And arguably the main character though is Charlie, who is enrolled at River Valley by her father um, after he kind of wins custody in a messy divorce that was at least partially caused by Charlie's mother's insistence that she not learn sign language and be fitted with a cochlear implant um, that Charlie found really painful and not that helpful in distinguishing sounds. So um, the kids at River Valley have many of the same, you know, experiences and angst that you would expect of any students like clicks and hooking up and tests, you know, studying for tests and that sort of thing. But they also have joys and difficulties that are very specific to the deaf community. And the conflict between deaf and hearing cultures and what deaf people are willing to do and sacrifice to define their own experience and identity are at the heart of this really gripping novel. Uh, the author of this book, Sarah Novich, is herself deaf and has written about deaf rights and her struggles in the predominantly hearing publishing world. So this novel reflects her lived experience and has really a lot of thought provoking details about deaf culture with some lessons on ASL and deaf history that were new to me, including the title, uh, which is a popular ASL idiom that is like similar to like real talk or seriously. Uh, I really highly recommend this one for back to school season. Okay, um, my next pick is uh, The Last Ride of the Pony Express by Will Grant. And I chose this one so that we could get like a history lesson, even if we aren't in school. Uh, but if you thought history class was just like a boring list of dates and names, um, then I think this is the way history should have been taught. Um, so the Pony Express was an overland mail route from St. Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento, California. It had stops every 10 to 20 miles for changing out horses. And it, it's like such a big part of our, the story of, you know, the American West. But I was shocked to find out that like it only lasted 18, about 18 months. 
Um, so in this book, journalist Will Grant rides the trail or kind of what's what's left of it where it used to be um, with his two horses, Badger and Chicken Fry. It isn't really a reenactment exactly because Grant takes over 100 days to cover what the original delivery riders would have ridden in 10. Um, instead, it's an exploration of the trail's history and its legacy. Grant interacts with many people along the way um, and discusses these interactions in the book. Um, and he talks about, um, you know, what still constitutes the Western spirit among farmers, ranchers, Mormons, and indigenous people that live in that area today. Um, he also writes quite a bit about horses, their importance and their care, and he describes the Western landscape just beautifully. This book is a great example of how history um, can be explored through doing, you know, um, while centering the experience of everyday people, not just politicians and battles, and by drawing connections between the past and the present. So if you like books like Rinker Buck's Oregon Trail or Ruth Goodman's How to Be a Victorian, um, or if you like watching like the Townsend's YouTube channel or PBS shows like Frontier House, uh, then definitely check out The Last Ride of the Pony Express. Uh, Harry is actually the first person that told me about this book, and we both agree that we like it even more than um, Rinker Buck's Oregon Trail, which this has uh, some similarities to. Okay. My last back to school suggestion is to read a classic. And some of you who have attended past library programs about books uh, with me or have been in my book groups know that I'm quite picky about pl classics and um, I, don't, I don't like a lot of them. Um, I just like a more modern writing style <laughs> most of the time. Um, but there are some that I really resonate with and uh, I Capture the Castle by Dodie Smith is one of them. Uh, it has the whimsical enchanting atmosphere of a cozy fantasy, even though it isn't fantasy, it doesn't have any magic, um, but it's probably because it takes place in like a rundown crumbling castle. So it's set in the 1930s and is told in the form of journal entries written by 17 year old uh, Cassandra Mortmain. Because her father is an author suffering from writer's block and her stepmother is this like free spirited loop playing sometimes artist model, uh, the family lives in genteel bohemian poverty uh, on this like crumbling estate. Cassandra does enjoy the freedom and imagination of their life and is close to her family, but she also feels their struggles acutely and wishes that things could go more positively for them. Their lives are shaken up when two wealthy American brothers move into the estate next door. One of them is a fan of James Mortman's novel, um, and both of them find the eccentric Mortman family like incredibly charming. Uh, they become close friends and then more with uh, Cassandra, with her sister Rose and Cassandra. Um, but like in a Jane Austen novel, there are some like personal and cultural and class misunderstandings and questions about whether each sister is with the right brother. Um, if you've ever wanted to live in a castle or you were a dreamy, quirky teenager, then this classic novel will get you like right in the feels. Okay. And then my forthcoming pick is Making It So, uh, the memoir by Patrick Stewart. It's coming out October 3rd. Um, I have long been a Star Trek fan, uh, and I watched The Next Generation with um, Patrick Stewart as Captain Picard with my family when it originally aired uh, in the very late 80s and early 90s. And my husband and I were really excited to watch Star Trek Picard, uh, whose first season aired in early 2020, and it kind of uh, completes the story of Captain Picard. And uh, when we were done with that first season, we were inspired to start rewatching um, The Next Generation. And we were like maybe, maybe half a season into that when the pandemic hit. And honestly, I really needed what Star Trek had to offer at that time. You know, um, a vision of hope and positive expectation that science and people working together can make the universe a better place. And there's very little that ruffles, pa you know, Captain Picard. Um, as played by Stewart, he takes everything in, in stride and respects the opinions and expertise of his crew. And Patrick Stewart is also a Shakespearean actor. And in 2020, he read a sonnet a day on his Instagram. And these two things were like an anchor for me <laughs> during a really dark and um, uncertain time. So I'm super excited to read Patrick Stewart's memoir and hear him describe his life in his elegant prose. Uh, plus, he reads the audiobook. And normally, I don't 
I don't always like when an author reads their own book because a lot of authors are, are not that good of readers, in, in my opinion. Um, but I could listen to Patrick Stewart read all day. So um, hop on the hold list for this one. We already have it on pre-order. So those are my picks. And I am going to hand it over to Tammy. So go ahead and take it away, Tammy. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my books are all historical fiction except for one surprise. So um, let's get into it. Um, my first book is Flipping Boxcars by Cedric Cowles, also known as Cedric the Entertainer. This is the first novel by St. Louis's own Cedric the Entertainer Cowles. You may know him as one of the original kings of comedy and from the hit TV show The Neighborhood. He says this book is based on the life of his grandfather, and this book is dedicated to his grandmother. Okay, let's get into it. Babe, the main character in the novel, is from Carruthersville, Missouri. He's a gambler, a dreamer, and a fast talker. Yearning for a better life for him and his family, Babe joins his friend Carter for one last chance at one large payday involving a scheme that involves railroad boxcars. They have 72 hours to raise $54,000 to buy 3,000 cases of bourbon from Canada. Let me read you an excerpt. The dice came to Babe again. Let's do the hard eight one more time. Two, four, square pie. Eight. Eight's my lucky number. August 8th is my birthday. Will this be Babe's last scheme? Will the FBI come looking for Babe? Will his wife leave him? Cedric the Entertainer recently said that he wrote this book like a movie, and it indeed reads like a movie. If you enjoy a book with a strong plot and well-developed characters, then this book is for you. Um, and a side note is I'm going to Cedric's book signing this Saturday um, so um, he can sign my copy of this book. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, my next pick is Lone Women by Victor Lavelle. Um, you may know Victor Lavelle from um, the author of The Changeling, which is now on um, Apple TV. Um, they made it into a series. Um, so Victor Lavelle brings us this book, Lone Women. It is 1915, and Adelaide Henry is a troubled woman. She carries a big trunk around, and she has just doused her childhood home with gasoline and set the house on fire with her parents inside. And her parents were farmers in California's Lucerne Valley. Adelaide is trying to get to the Port of Los Angeles to get to Montana to become a homesteader. She wants to take advantage of the government's program of offering free land. Her and others begin living on the land, but she has deep, dark secrets that keep a grip on her. Through the rough terrain and the trials and tribulations of living off the land, Adelaide must come to terms with the choices that she has made and confront her troubled past, which may be the only thing that will save her. This book is so good and haunting. Let me tell you, this book is good. Um, I recommend that you uh, listen to it on audio. I listen to it on audio. Oh, it's so good. Um, listening to it, I could visualize, I could see her pouring the gasoline on the steps in the house. It's just that good. Um, the New York Times called it one of the best books of 2023, and I couldn't agree more. This is my surprise pick. Um, I have never chosen um, a book uh, of short stories, but here we go. Um, this one is Even If the Sky is Falling, edited by Taj McCoy with stories by Lane Clark, Farrah Haran, Taj McCoy, Cherish Reed, Sarah Smith, and Denise Williams. What would you do if the world was ending? Would you find your long lost love? Would you hide out with your former crush? Well, we're about to find out. Um, this is a collection of romantic short stories. When an international warning sign accidentally goes off, everyone is convinced that a media shower may end it all. Six couples must now take shelter. Let's quickly meet the couples. First, you have two NASA specialists who are ex-lovers and they come together under immense pressure. Secondly, you have two food stall owners who, who have no escape plan, so they must confront their past. Third, you have two law school students who are opposites, yet the sparks just won't stop flying between them. Fourth, you have two book lovers who confront their feelings for each other while sheltering in a bookstore bunker. That's my favorite one. 
Fifth, you have a songwriter who falls for a contractor. And lastly, you have two college students trapped on campus and they're trying to reignite their spark for one another. This book is a feel good book and great for curling up on the couch with your favorite blanket with a cup of coffee or a cup of hot tea. Ah, my next one is Harlem After Midnight by Louise Hare. This is Louise's second book in this um, Canary Club series. Lena Aldridge, who is the main character, she grew up in London. She had dreams of big lights um, on Broadway. She arrives in Harlem via the Queen Mary. She thought she would be with her father, but now he is dead and she is on her own in New York City. Will Goodman, the music musician she met on the Queen Mary, invited Lena to stay with his friends. And her friend, his friends don't believe her and she don't believe them. They don't trust each other for some reason. Um, so what happens is when a body falls from the townhouse in Harlem that she's staying at, and it looks like the newest singer from, Har from Harlem, Lena is wondering, who can she trust? And now she may also have a target on her back. Well, all while she's chasing her dreams of being on Broadway. If you like mysteries and historical fiction, which I do, then this book is for you. I like Lena, and I tell you, I love reading books um, from this time period. This one is a hard, oh, it's going to grip you. This one is The Last Lifeboat by Hazel Gaynor. Um, this book is based on true events. Um, it's 1940 and Alice King is a school teacher from Kent, England, who has no idea what she's about to embark on. It is World War II. A plane has just crashed in her home and she embarks on a mission to help children escape war and go to Canada. The other character, Lily, is a housewife and a mother from London. With her husband gone and the constant bombings, she has to make a choice, keep her children close to her or sign them up for the government's evacuation program, which is safe or, or is it safe? Um, let me read you an excerpt. Um, this comes from um, later on in the book in 1940 and their lifeboat is in the middle of the mid-Atlantic in front of Alice in a space no more than three feet across across the children huddle beneath a tarpaulin canopy jimmy put up in the night to give them some protection from the storm they cling to one another as one miserable mass lurching and swaying as the ocean rises and falls so that one minute the lifeboat seems to be touching the sky and the next it is plunging into a deep trough surrounded by curtains of seething water this book is heart wrenching up uh, and, and have your tissues nearby because you're going to cry and um, it's filled with a range of emotions, but it is a good book. And again, it's based on true events. I really, really enjoyed this book um, by Hazel Gaynor. This one, um, the historical girlies have been waiting on. Um, the release date is January 30th, and, and we're ready for it. Um, it's 1921, and Nellie Sawyer is the daughter of the wealthiest Black man in America. They are the epitome of Black society. With the unexpected death of her brother, Nellie becomes the premier debutante seemingly overnight. But Nellie isn't interested in all the high society. She has been working undercover as an investigative journalist, chronicling the achievements and tribulations of Black people living in the Jim Crow era. But now she has found herself with a dangerous assignment involving the notorious mayor of Maxwell Street. Jay Shorey is from the backwoods of Alabama the son of a murdered biracial couple. He makes his way to Chicago and becomes the captain of the city's underworld, running Chicago's speakeasy where the gangsters and the politicians mingle. Nellie asks Jay to help her expose the mayor of Maxwell Street to help change the city. Soon Jay and Nellie begin a relationship that will introduce Nellie to the dangerous underworld. Will she be able to stay on the right side of the law? Ugh. Will the glitz and glamour of the underworld pull her in? Read this book to find out. Um, I saw this book on Twitter, and let me tell you, people are ranting and raving about this book. This is Avery Cunningham's debut novel, and uh, we can't wait to January 30th, 2024 to read this one. So now um, I'll hand it off to Catherine.
Thank you, Tammy. Oh, that one. Yeah. So my first pick, my first pick is Stephen King's Fairy Tale, which I know came out uh, in 2022. And I know it actually turned off quite a few people. I know a couple of my friends didn't want to read it because they're like, oh, a fantasy by Stephen King. I'd rather have like the spooky, the psychological thrillers. Um, but do not skip this book. It's 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 a it's a great book. It's um it's about a boy. Oh, sorry, <clears throat> getting over being sick. Um, it's about a boy named Charlie Reed who seems to have it all. Um, he sees an elderly recluse neighbor get into a fall and he takes it upon himself to help that neighbor. Um, the neighbor has a dog as well. And as they get closer and closer, as he helps him more and the man trusts him, he gives him, he leaves him a cassette tape in his will. And after listening to this cassette tape, Charlie is immersed in a story that can't be real. It can't, it can't be real. That can't be anything but fantasy. But after hearing strange noises coming from a shed in the man's backyard, he goes forth and discovers a parallel universe, a parallel world where magic and darkness and curses and giants and good versus evil is at play. And it's up to Charlie to fulfill what the man could not. And along the way, he makes friends with royal family members who are cursed, and he's trying to figure out why they're cursed. There's men and women fighting to the death for the enjoyment of the fair one um, who runs this world and brings the darkness, and there's evil working behind every corner. And there's a, a magic sundial that can turn back time that Charlie needs to discover like the mysteries of and to try and save this world and make it back home. And it's it's a delightful book and if you have any sort of qualms about it it is pretty thick but don't like give it a try my friend read the audio or listened to the audiobook and she said that was also amazing um so i i wouldn't i wouldn't look past this book even though it's a fantasy it's great and i i personally love reading fantasies in the fall it's like the perfect book to sit um at home on the cooler evenings and just get immersed in the world so i recommend this book a lot Uh, my next book, my next pick is How Can I Help You by Laura Sims. Um, this book is a perfect fall book about murder and obsession. That just kind of seems like a fall vibe. Um, it's a quick read. It's, it's fairly shorter than a lot of other books, but um, retired nurse, retired nurse Margot works as a librarian and is hiding from her past as a serial murderer. She thinks she has it all and that no one could ever suspect her new wife. When a new resource librarian named Patricia starts working at the library, things begin to unravel for Margot. Patricia seems to notice too much and is intent on finding out what Margot is hiding. And when a patron dies in the bathroom, that really spurs Patricia on to kind of figure out what's going on behind the scenes and what, why is Margot so suspicious? Um, this, book ha this book has the perfect combination, humor, suspense, surprises, it just keeps you invested the whole time. It, it really is a quick read once you start reading, just, just how the writing style, you want to know what happens. You want to keep reading. You want to figure out what's going on. Um, I recommend this book to everybody, especially librarians. Uh, my next pick is Batman The Long Halloween by Jeff Loeb. Um, I'm a big Batman fan. I have been for a long time. Like I started with the comics and the movies and... Um, the, the video games. And this one is actually a continuation of Batman year, year one, but you don't have to read year one to understand this one. It's kind of its own separate thing. Um, but this, this volume that we have is um, 13 issues condensed into one volume. And these were issues that came out in 1996 to 1997. So this, this story takes place during Batman's early days of crime fighting. Um, and tells the story of a mysterious killer who murders his victims only on the holidays. So they get, like Batman gets like a month off each time, each time there's a murder. Um, and so Batman's working with Harvey Dent and uh, Lieutenant James Gordon, and they have to race against the clock to try to figure out who the murderer is before he claims his ne next victim each month. Um, 
this keeps you guessing like who it is each time each time a new character is introduced you're like, oh could that be the killer could that be the killer it introduces characters that show up later on and become established characters uh catwoman's in it poison ivy's in it um it also the story ties into events that transform harvey dent into two-face so it's kind of like a precursor to that as well and this is I mean, I like to read this around Halloween I and mean, it's called The Long Halloween, but honestly, you could read this around any holiday because there's a murder around every holiday. So, um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a perfect book to read like around Halloween. Um, I, I like to throw, anytime I do a program, I like to put a nonfiction book in as well, which I know a lot of people do. Um, this book is called Ice, From Mixed Drinks to Skating Rinks, A Cool History of a Hot Commodity by Amy Brady. Um, I told, I was telling my book group about this and I was like, oh guys, I just read this book called Ice. And they're like, um, okay, yeah, you want us to read a book about ice? Um, but hear me out. It is, it's a nonfiction book, but it chronicles a fascinating history of how ice helped shape the culture and economy of America and the world. Um, it starts with Frederick Tudor from New England who had the idea to, market ice and try and sell ice to the West Indies and to the South, like the American South. Um, and everybody thought he was eccentric and crazy because nobody's gonna buy ice. They were cutting it up from the rivers and nobody's gonna wanna buy that. But he managed to find a market for it. It changed drinks around the world. Um, and from there, it brought about um like winter sports that we use every day or that we that we do every day like the blues hockey team and um preserving pre preserving food medical advances figure skating speed skating ice skating the olympics we wouldn't have winter sports without this market for ice um it talked about how refrigeration and freezers came into being because of ice like a lot of people that i talked to about this book remembered having ice boxes and this book talks about how those came about because of the sale and promotion of ice and how there was a monopoly um, of ice companies to produce and sell this and to store it. It was actually, it was, it was a fascinating read. And there was a lot of cutthroat like competition in the ice market back in the day, like in the 1920s. And it was, it was a fascinating book about a history that I personally didn't know much about. Um, and each chapter focuses on a different topic, like surrounding ice, like how it was used in the past, how it, um, like refrigeration, the ice houses, and then how, like sports, and then how it affects us in the future as well, um, because of our use for, of ice and for cooling is changing the way that the planet is responding. Um, and so this is just, it's a perfect, for me, it's a perfect fall read because like, you know, fall in Missouri, you never know what you're going to get. It could still be a 90 degree day when it should be fall. Um, so this just kind of gets you in that fall, winter kind of mood and kind of kind of cools you down a little bit. It was it was a very good book. I, I really recommend. Um, oh, my next book was The Ladies of the Secret Circus by Constance Sayers. Um, this was a very good book. It, it really made me feel like a lot for fall because it was about like magic and mystery and like love and drama. And it was, it's just, it's just life. Awesome thing I do. Um, so it's a unique novel, grabbed my attention the whole time. The story alternates between the past and the present. So the past and present then collide in an interesting twist. So in 1925 in Paris, there's a secret circus that only people with a mysterious ticket that shows up randomly can attend. So if you have a ticket, you can see the circus. If your friend next to you doesn't have a ticket, they can't see it. So there's magic and mystic, mysticness about it. Um, so Cecile, in 1925, she grows up in this circus with her twin sister, and she falls in love with a local artist. And then in 2020, 2020 2004 in Virginia, present, present day, Laura is getting married but her fiance disappears the day of the wedding and nobody can find him. And they find his car on the bend in the road near their small town. Every 30 years, a young man disappears 
on that spot in the exact same spot on the same day every 30 years. Everyone has secrets that are to be revealed in this book. Some secrets have been in the family for generations. I recommend this book to anybody looking for like mystery, secrets, magic, suspense, drama, love. It's, it really, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. Like I'm, I'm the type of person that likes to try to like, oh, okay, yeah, that's that person. That's that person. That's going to happen. This one, you don't see, you can't figure it out by the end. It's, it's great. It's a great book. I, I very much recommend. So my future pick that I'm really excited about is The Cemetery of Untold Stories by Julia Alvarez. Um, it comes out in April, April 2nd, so it's a little ways off. I like, to, I like to play around on Goodreads and kind of look around on there and look at upcoming things. And this caught my eye. And I went back and forth for a while um, between this and another book, about what I wanted to talk about. But this one I just kept coming back to because it just seems, it just seems so interesting to me. I'll give you a little word about it. So Alma Cruz inherits a small plot of land in the Dominican Republic, her homeland. She has the beautiful idea of turning it into a place to bury her untold stories, literally. She creates a graveyard for the manuscript drafts and revisions and the characters whose lives she tried and failed to bring to life and who still haunt her. Alma wants her characters to rest in peace. She wants to forget about them, but they have other ideas and the cemetery becomes a mysterious sanctuary for their true narratives. <laughs> The characters defy them, they defy her and they talk back to her and they talk to one another behind her back, rewriting and revising themselves. Um, the cemetery of untold stories, whose stories get told and whose stay buried. Uh, one of the things that like interested me is the recommendations for this were, if you liked Isabel Allende's Violetta, which I know is very popular, or, Bob, or Barbara Kingsolver's Demon Copperhead, um, then this is kind of along that similar vein. And it, I'm, I'm very excited about it. And I hope other people are too. Um, and then next we have uh, Sarah to talk about Harry's picks. Awesome, thank you so much, Catherine. All right. So yes, so Harry has forwarded me some information about his picks. So I'm just gonna go ahead and read his blurbs for you. Um, so his first pick is Bogey and Bacall by William J. Mam. And Harry says, who doesn't love a good celebrity biography? In Bogey and Bacall, Mam profiles two iconic actors, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and he clinically removes the myths about them. So Bogey was a lifelong functioning alcoholic, a rich kid, and the product of indifferent parents. Uh, he was on his third marriage when he met Bacall, and he was seriously unfaithful, or serially unfaithful, but not the tough guy that he portrayed on the screen. He was insecure and emotional. Um, and Bacall, whose parents split when she was young, was cold and driven, yet dedicated to Bogey. She was 20 years younger than him. And after they married, she polished his reputation while destroying his ex-wives. They had a very tumultuous marriage. Uh, the book concludes with her struggle to find love again and to prove that she was more than just Mrs. Bogart. Uh, this is a great read, respectful of the, the subjects, um, but blunt. Okay, Harry's next pick is Crow Mary by Kathleen Grissom. The author of The Kitchen House returns with a first-person historical fiction novel about a Native American woman who married a white Montana fur trader in the 1870s. Uh, based on fact, Grissom's heroic portrayal is endorsed by the great-granddaughter of the woman who inspired the book. Married at 16, Mary had to adjust to her al alcoholic husband who wanted to raise her children as yellow eyes, which was like the colloquial um, crow term for, for white people. Will she find friends? What about her heritage? Mary witnesses an atrocity committed by white fur trappers and has to take matters into her own hands. This is for readers who enjoy accounts of a woman's grit, resilience, love of family, and triumph over adversity. Okay, Harry's next pick is Banyan Moon by Tao Tai. Um, as a lover of generational family drama, this book fits the bill. There are alternating points of view as the book shows how three generations of women coped with escape from 1960s Vietnam to California and then to modern day Florida. What does the Banyan tree in their family home mean? In this emotional tale, will three strong-willed women ever reconcile? Beautifully written, this is for readers of character-driven literary fiction. 
Harry's next pick is The Paris Agent by Kelly Rimmer. Uh, and he says, quote, now I can move on to mysteries and thrillers, which if you've seen many of these is Harry's um, favorite, favorite genre. He says in the Paris agent, Charlotte, the daughter of Noah, a former British agent in World War II France, tries to reconnect with her memory impaired father with the or tries to reconnect her memory impaired father with the Renaissance fighter who saved his life. Was Noah a hero or a villain to female British spies in France? The book has dual narratives as we move between 1940s France and two female agents in 1970s England. Uh, based on, on a real fact, the book is very well researched. We learn a lot of history as Charlotte discovers the truth about her father's hidden life in this emotional, riveting book. And Harry says this book would be especially great for uh, fans of Kate Quinn. All right. His next pick is The Bitter Past by Bruce Borgos. Um, and Harry says this is one of the best books in any genre that he has read this year. It's a blend of spy, thriller, and police procedural. Um, Beck, a rural Nevada sheriff, investigates the brutal murder of a retired FBI agent who was searching for Russian spies in a World War II nuclear program. How could a decades-old nuclear program cause murder today? The book has alternating timelines, but is mainly set in the present. Beck, retired from military intelligence, is paired with a female FBI agent who wants to run the case. Will they solve the murder? With a major twist at the end, at the end fans of Craig Johnson and C.J. Box will appreciate this thriller. And then Harry's forthcoming pick is The Fury by Alex Michaelides, and it comes out January 16th. And he says, what's not like to, to what's not to like here? Uh, this book has an unreliable narrator that reconnect, recounts a death on a Greek island amidst a group of untrustworthy Hollywood characters. With references to Agatha Christie and the author's previous books, this has received rave early reviews. It's set during Easter um, and... The question is, was it the fury, an island wind that caused the death or something more sinister? Uh, Michael Edes is the king of psychological thrillers, and uh, this book has nods to ancient Greece. So this is another winner here. All right. So um, I'm just going to do a little bit of wrap up stuff. So if you do have questions for us, uh, if you want to put those into the chat, uh, we will answer those in just a minute here. But I know we gave you a lot of different title suggestions tonight, but if you would like more suggestions that are personalized just to your taste, you can fill out the personalized reading form on our website um, and tell us what you like and what you don't like, and we will send you a list of five titles that we have created just for you. You can find it on our website under the Books, E-Media, and More tab. And then uh, because you like stories, um, I thought you might uh, be interested in these upcoming programs. We are hosting the St. Louis Storytelling Festival October 18th to the 28th at various times and locations around St. Louis. You can find out more about all of the different events um, on our website uh, about the Storytelling Festival. And then we are having an in-person um kind of book-based program called Book Group Pick Sip and Stroll on Wednesday, November 1st at the Merrimack Valley Branch. In this program, we're going to have some of our library book group leaders set up at different stations, and you can go and you can pick up a drink and you can stroll between the different stations and talk to them about their favorite books. You can mingle with other readers. We'll have some door prizes. It's going to be a really fun time. So we hope that we see you at that program. And um, yeah, now we're going to open it up to some questions. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and put us back in a gallery mode. And if you do have any questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat. So let's see here. Okay, great. And Catherine and Tammy, if you want to go ahead and turn on your cameras, you can. And let's see here. Okay. Okay, the first question is for Tammy. Um, someone wants to know, do you have more details on the Cedric the Entertainer book signing? You said it was on Saturday. Do you know when and where it is? Um, it is Saturday um, at 7 p.m. at the High Point Theater. Um, it's sponsored by Left Bank Books and tickets are $40 and you receive a copy of the book and he'll be there doing a QA. and a Awesome, thank you. Yeah. I was just at the High, the High Point because they hosted a Star Trek Day uh, 
viewing of, of lower decks episodes anyway so I'm, I'm glad that the high point it got it got um, bought recently by a nonprofit, mm-hmm. so it's like back open which is kind of nice okay let's see here Okay, another another uh, question for for Tammy. Um, can you remind us what the time period is for Harlem after midnight? Like what? Um, I believe it's nineteen thirty six, somewhere in there in the thirties. Okay, somewhere in there. Cool. I wanted to point out, Tammy. I have read um, the Changeling by Victor Laval, and I just mm-hmm. like loved it. I didn't know that it was. Uh, I, don't, I don't have Apple TV. Uh, but uh, I didn't know it was a, a streaming series, so I definitely want to read Lone mm-hmm. Women. He's just yeah, yeah read yeah. read Lone Women. Yeah, it's really like intense. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. It is. Mm-hmm. Um. All right. Um. So I have some. I don't see. I do see a lot of thank yous, but I don't see any other questions right now. So if you do have questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. Um. But for Tammy and Catherine, are not to put you on the spot. But are you reading anything good right now? Or have just read something that's not on your list and doesn't have to be fall related at all? No, I read now. Oh, man. I, yes, I actually just finished reading uh, Fourth Wing um, by, I think it's Re- Rebecca Yaros. Um, I know it's like the number one bestseller right now, and for a good reason, it's really good. Like if you're a big fantasy uh, reader, it's it's very good. It's it's a little spicy, so be prepared for that. Um, but it's about a girl who is forced into an elite like dragon training riding school by her mother, who's like the commander of the the armies, um, and she's kind of on the like weaker side and just her struggles and triumphs trying to get there trying to bond with the dragon trying to make it in this world that's out to get her when everybody has an ulterior motive and everybody's trying to either kill her and she's not sure who she can trust and it's I ignored the book for a long time just because of how hyped up it was because I'm like okay it's not going to be that great but it really is and the second book is already on order so if you do really enjoy this get yourself on the list for it because there's going to be a long wait list so really recommend you should probably read it I like you when something is like really hyped up I'm like less mm-hmm. motivated to read it yeah because oftentimes it doesn't doesn't do it for me yeah I had checked it out at one point and I was like eh no and returned it and then my friend was like no you have to read this so we can talk about it and so I reread it I read it and I'm in love with it now so um yes so the name again it's fourth wing by Rebecca Yaros, um, and I can pull up, I can put that in the chat too. Yes. Are you reading, are you reading anything good, Tammy? Um, I finished um, The House of Eve by Sadiqa Johnson, mm-hmm. um, excellent. Um, she wrote The Yellow Wife. Um, so it, it's about um, a lady, um, a college student at Howard University, she gets pregnant. And it's doing, you know, the '60s. I think during that time, that Jim Crow time. So um, it's it's a lot going on in that one. So I, I finished that one. I thought that one was good. Everybody, it's popular. So yeah. Yeah, I thought about considering that for for my list because it would have gone with my sort of back to school mm-hmm. theme. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I am in the middle of um of the golden enclaves by naomi novik which is the third book in the um scholamount series uh which is uh about a magical school but a very original magical school i'll just say that it's it's uh this is no harry potter so um if you like <laughs> if you like a dark kind of fantasy uh the scholamount series is is really good one okay i see some other questions popping up in the chat so let's see here okay Oh, someone, oh, so the first is the the sip and stroll. Someone asked about the date of the sip and stroll. It is on no, Wednesday, November 1st at the Merrimack Valley branch. And I will be putting a link to register for that in the follow-up email. Um, and I send the follow-up email out when the video is ready to post on YouTube. So sometimes that takes a couple days, but, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll have a, a registration link in the chat. 
Okay, someone uh, else asked about whether we get advanced copies from publishers, and if so, what do we do with them when we have read them? Um, I, I'll, I'll answer for the library in general. Um, so the, the library, yes, does get um, advanced reader copies. They're sent to our acquisitions department. Uh, they often use them in order to help make decisions about like what to buy at the library. And then they, they uh, offer them out to library staff and we are encouraged to like read them and talk about them and, you know, pass them on. You can't resell uh, uh, advanced reader copies. So the only thing you can do with them is like give them away to friends put them in little libraries, you can't sell them. So um, so we can't put them on thrift books or anything like that. But, um, and I will say this too, um, we get fewer physical advanced reader copies than we used to. Uh, more and more advanced reader copies are done digitally and you can sign up to get them through um, a couple of different places, including Edelweiss. Uh, and if you are a library staff member, you're more likely to get these digital copies. Um, so yeah, we get fewer of the physical copies than than we used to. The publishing industry has sort of moved on. And I think the pandemic kind of accelerated uh, mm -hmm. that move from physical to digital copies. Um, so it's also cheaper for the, like for the publisher. <laughs> um, all right. Oh, Catherine, someone asked, is the Ladies of the Secret Circus anything like the secret I life of Addie LaRue? Is it similar in any way? Good question. Um, both, I similar, different, like different plots, but similar. Like they both deal with kind of like mysticism and like darkness and um, kind of like that internal trauma of like these, the main characters. Um, I would say if you're a fan of The Secret Life of Addie LaRue, you'll be a fan of um, The Ladies of the Secret Circus. I think you'll really enjoy it. Okay. Uh, Tammy, can you repeat the name of the book about the female steward, uh, student from Howard University? Um, it's The House of Eve by Sadiqa Johnson. Would you mind typing that into the chat? Mm hmm sure. Yep, I'll type it. No problem. Let me see. Um, sorry, I'm looking something up to answer one of the other questions. So, um, yeah, I couldn't remember the name of my own program, which I wanted to recommend. So someone in the chat um, is asking about, so they said that they love to read, but they struggle to find the time to read. And when do we all get our reading done? So um, I just want to give a like a plug for one of my own virtual programs that I did uh, earlier in the spring, and it is on our YouTube channel, and I'll try to remember to link it in the follow-up email. It was called Spring Into Reading, and um, much of the program is about getting over reader's block. I had, a, I had a very big struggle with reader's block through much of 2020 into 2022, uh, and I had to do research a lot of strategies to get over that, so I share a lot of those strategies in that program. And um, I'll, I'll try to remember to link that in the follow up email. But um, as for finding time to read, um, one of the things I talk about in there is that sometimes when we say we don't have time to read, it just means we don't have we don't want to use the time we have to do something that requires such focus. And that really a lot of it has to do with our own struggle with focus, which I have found many people have trouble with these days. It's a widespread problem. So um, there are some tips in there. For me personally, um, I tend to read before bed um, or sometimes in the morning. I, uh, I have trouble with insomnia. I sometimes wake up very, very early. Uh, on the weekends, I'll wake up like hours before other people. Uh, so I'll read in the morning. Um, I sometimes read at lunch. Uh, but yeah, finding like kind of this like scheduled time to read is good. I don't know, do, Tammy or um, Catherine, do you have any tips about when you read? Um, I find myself not listening to books on audio yeah. on the way to work, um, doing that commute um, and on the way home. I find myself now like that lone women. I listen to that on audio. So um, I find myself now doing more audio for some reason. And I read before bed, but um, I, I'm really doing a lot of audio now. Yeah, I um, I recently had a struggle with like finding time to read too. I have a two year old daughter. So my time is not um, <laughs> conducive for reading a lot of times. So I'll like read when she goes to bed before I go to bed for a short period of time, or I'll read like at lunch, um, or read before work sometimes before we have to clock in. So I'm just trying to find that little time. And I've also 
realized that because of like that lack of time that I have, I am like more critical of the books that I read now. If I start a book and I'm like, eh, this isn't catching me in the first chapter or two, I'll put it down. I'll put it away because I'm not going to spend my time reading something that's not going to like bring me, bring me joy and uh, I'll find something else. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, I, I I do talk about in that virtual program that um, one thing that did help me with my focus for a while is that I was simultaneously listening to books and reading them with my eyes at the same time. So um, that would sometimes like help me focus from two directions. Um, but yeah, I, I like a good audio book. Uh, and it's a very different experience, you know, like, well, um, Catherine, you, you run a book group. Sometimes you'll like, you'll like a book that the group will dislike, or they'll like, they'll like something that you disliked. And you realize it's because like you listened to it on audio and they didn't, you know, uh, it really does. Yeah. It changed the experience. Um, all right. Well, I see lots of thank yous in the chat, um, but I think we will go ahead and wrap it up there. So yeah, thank you. Let's see. Okay, yeah, just more thank yous. More thank yous in the chat. Uh, so uh, yeah, I just want to um, thank Tammy and Catherine especially for joining us tonight uh, and taking time out of their, their regular library duties. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we wish you all a happy fall. We hope to see you at another program soon and have a lovely, a lovely evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>